Okay. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, Professor Josef Frutl. Uh, we are starting now the live transmission of the conference number 11, Aesthetics and the Philosophy of Time Travel in Science Fiction, The Arrival and Interstellar. Professor, hope you are doing well. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Let me say that it is a normal joy and an honor to have you with us today, the last day of the colloquium. I would like to shortly introduce you to our audience before passing you the microphone. Josef Ruth was born in 1954, study of philosophy, theory of literature and sociology in Frankfurt and also in Paris. In 1985, he received his PhD at the University of Frankfurt, a mine, and as a postdoc, he was recipient of an Alexander of on Humboldt's research fellowship in Pisa, Italy. Immediately after that, he received a scholarship of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft at the University of Frankfurt, where he finished in 1995 his habilitation. One year later, he became associate professor of philosophy, focused on aesthetics and theory of culture at the University of Münster in Germany. He was president of the German Society for Aesthetics and is co-editor of the Mayor Journal of Aesthetics in Germany, the Zeitschrift für Aesthetik und Allgemeine Kunstwissenschaft. Josef Rutl was appointed chair in philosophy of art and culture at the University of Amsterdam in 2005, where he became emeritus professor last year. In Brazil, was a visiting professor at the Federal University of Goiás and also at the Rural uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Among many articles and books published, I would like to remember the last book published in 2017 by Rutledge, Trust in the World, a Philosophy of Few. Welcome, Josef. Please uh, join us. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Miguel. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning in, in uh, Brazil. It's afternoon in Europe. Uh, thank you once again, Miguel, for inviting me. And thank you also to the whole group, to Carla and other people who are organizing this uh, conference. I, I can imagine how much work that is. Uh, even if it is done online. Um, of course, I regret not to be in Brazil uh, physically, and I hope that we, we will have another opportunity to be together and have fine discussions in uh, Brazil. So um, what I want to do today is, uh, as Miguel already has announced, uh, give a uh, lecture on uh, the concept of time travel in uh, some science fiction movies. Um, and this is hopefully a nice contribution to your, to your conference. Um, I will go to uh, PowerPoint full screen now and you uh, will be able to follow me uh, then, so I try to do this. Okay. <clears throat> so let me start with a simple definition. Traveling means moving of people over a longer period of time, either to reach a goal or to get to know places. Let me add that traveling has not been a topic in philosophy. There is no philosophy of traveling. Philosophy preferred another term, namely the term experience. Starting already with uh, Aristotle, empiria, uh, the term experience became prominent in Anglo-Saxon empiricism, in Kant's transcendental philosophy and Hegel's phenomenology, 
in John Dewey's art as experience and in critical theory, especially in the German word Erfahrung, this is the German word for the English experience, you can hear the noun Fahrt, which in English is drive, ride, trip, journey, in Portuguese, Yajem. So traveling has not been a topic in philosophy, but it has been a topic in an old competitor of philosophy, namely in literature. So we know Homer's Odyssey and Virgil's Aeneid from the old Greek and Roman culture. We know Sinbad the sailor from the Arabic culture, and we know Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's travels from the early 18th century. Traveling finally is a topic in film, evidently in genres like the Western movie and the road movie starting in the 1960s. So you certainly know Easy Rider, Antonioni's Sabrisky Point, the Wim Wenders, Alice uh, in the city, and you have, we have a very fine actual and contemporary example with the film Nomad Land uh, came out a few weeks ago. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to seeing it. So um, the genre science fiction within movies, of course, works with the topos of traveling as well. And one more a famous example, of course, is Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yeah, you see already in the title, Odyssey, the old uh, story from Homer comes uh, back. But we should be aware of something else. Namely, that time, space and movement are constitutive for film as such. In a philosophical and ontological sense, film can be conceptualized as dynamization of space and spatialization of time. Watching a movie, we are constantly moving because our eyes are more or less identical with the lens of the camera which itself is constantly moving or changing the perspective. Not only are on the screen, but is moving within space, but space itself is moving via the camera and the cutting. So I want to refer to movies that allow us to see, to feel, to experience what it is like or what it could be like to move within time as if it were a space, or to move within space as if it were time. So my lecture is interested in movies that allow us to have a different experience of time or an experience of a different time. I'm interested in a kind of cinematic traveling that changes our experience and concept of time. And Christopher Nolan's Interstellar from 2014 and Denise Villeneuve's Arrival from 2016 are my examples. So let me start with, uh, with Interstellar. So like almost all science fiction movies after the 1950s, Interstellar has a dystopic starting point. The climate has changed, food is getting scarce, storms rush over the country, people are suffocating and starving. So they learn that they have to leave the world behind. As the head of NASA explains, so I give you a short, a very short summary of the, the plot of the story. So the head of NASA explains there are two plans for evacuating uh, humanity from, uh, from Earth. Plan A wants as many people as possible be evacuated with a space station and resettled on a planet in another galaxy. In case this does not work out, plan B 
should be applied, which schedules to bring deep frozen ovules to the new planet to guarantee the survival of the species. There is some hope that such a planet indeed exists because after having sent some years ago a couple of scientists on an intergalactic journey, some of them indeed seem to send signals to gain certainty whether this is really true, but whether these signals are relevant. Another group of scientists should start such a journey. Among them, Captain Cooper, um, played by Matthew McConaughey. And in fact, on one of the planets, indeed, conditions will be found similar to those on Earth. The daughter of the head of NASA, Amelia, played by Anne Hathaway, uh, being herself a member of the crew of scientists, lands on that planet carrying the deep frozen human ovules with her. So plan B can be executed. But plan A is successful as well. Cooper succeeds in maneuvering a space shuttle into a so-called black hole. That is a, a cosmologic area where gravity is so strong that all matter and light gets roped into it and cannot get out again. Whatever gets roped into it is teared up by enormous forces. But in the movie, I mean, it's a movie, this surprisingly does not happen to Cooper and his crew. Instead, he finds himself within an area that one has to imagine as a four-dimensional hyper dice, a so-called tesseract from the Greek tesseres actinus, which means four axes. In that area, it is possible to move within time. Uh, we are within a four-dimensional space a four-dimensional era, it is possible to move within uh, time as if it were a space. So right and left, so to speak, up and down, forward, back. One is captured, one is not captured in a single dimension, namely in presence. Yeah? He can look, Cooper can look at himself standing in the room of his daughter, so you see Cooper in his four-dimensional room, stand looking at himself, seeing him with uh, his uh, daughter, and afterwards seeing her as grown-up, performed by Jessica uh, Chastain. Since he is even able to communicate with her, though only indirectly, by using the second hand of his watch uh, in a manner of a Morse alphabet, so again, we are watching a movie. Cooper can send his daughter the data necessary for executing the big evacuation plan. So plan A is successful as well. Telling you the story in that way, I'm sure it must sound like a foolish mixture of science and fairy tale. Nevertheless, Experts in astrophysics have much praising words for the movie. And this, the reason for this is that even in its most speculative parts, like the flight into a black hole, the film can rely on the fact that what it shows is hypothetically and mathematically possible. It isn't nonsense. The narrative clue of Interstellar consists in bringing together beginning and end of the story in a circular form. And I will come back to that also in my later film, the second film, the circular form of time. We know this kind of storytelling, of course, from myths, but, there is, but here, in our case, it is science that reactualizes that kind of storytelling. At the beginning, Interstellar tells us the story of a ghost who seems to push books out of the shelf in the room of Cooper's daughter. The girl reacts to this in the way her father, as a typical scientist, 
uh, has told her, observe and analyze. She finds out that the gaps between the books fallen out of the shelf have to be read like a code and that there is a message. Stay. Neither the girl nor her father, Cooper, nor we, the spectators, really understand what that means at the beginning of the movie. But at the end, we all do. The ghost, the so-called ghost, sending messages is nobody else than Cooper himself. How is that possible? Well, within the four-dimensional construction of the Tesseract, Cooper can move, as I already have said, in time, in a way it is impossible for us. He is able to watch himself as if he were objectifying subject and observed object at the same time, as if he were witness of his own actions. In other words, as if he were watching himself in a movie. And this is the key word for me, movie. Interstellar certainly is a well done visualization of a physical theory. I, I would say it is really a well done visualization. Following that theory, the universe is self consistent, the future already present. Later is the same as before, and before is the same as later. Within the artificial form of the Tesseract, the four dimensional uh, um, space time, Cooper realizes the paradox that he has sent himself to that place. In the context of quantum physics and cosmology, it makes sense to say, I am at the same time at two different places. The elements of the quantum world, so we learned in physics, can be in several conditions at the same time. Indeterminacy is a genuine feature of all quantum objects. As long as an electron isn't disturbed by measuring, it looks like a ghost. So, so scientists say it looks like a ghost being everywhere and nowhere. Thus, if time turns out to be a loop, it doesn't make sense any longer to distinguish between first and then initially and subsequently, the future is already present. So this is the, the, the scientific part of the movie. And I'm convinced that it is very well done on that level. But Interstellar is much more than an exciting and coherent visualization of science. The fascination of the movie stems moreover from the way it converts an astrophysical theory in cinematic perception. Thus, the effect of the movie finally is an aesthetic one. And the best experience of that effect is offered by the visualization of the time loop. So, Together with Cooper, we are diving into the spatialized time of the Tesseract, which looks like a computer simulation of a modern huge building, and we are floating through interlaced transparent spatial flights. This is really a, one of the finest experiences you can have watching the movie. The film makes visible but at the same time puts, so to speak, an invisible veil upon the visible. Thus, the film handles the game of, speaking in a Heideggerian way, riddling and unriddling, revealing and concealing. This is what Interstellar in the end is about. This is at least where I'm convinced of. It presents film itself as a higher dimension. Watching, or better, experiencing a movie thus means to dive into a temporalized space or a spatialized time. 
interstellar is in its own way a space-time continuum. So you may say a movie, especially a movie like Interstellar, is an ordinary experience of that theoretical claim that astrophysics and quantum physics are, are telling us for, for quite some time, the famous space-time continuum. Time becomes space and space becomes time. The movie is the aesthetic form that allows us to have such an experience. And it's only the movie. Let me come to my second example, Arrival. Arrival is about the efforts of a small group of scientists to communicate with aliens of an extraterrestrial spaceship that has landed somewhere in the state of Montana. All in all, there are 12 of these spaceships spread over the whole world. And the group of scientists wants to find out why they have come into the human planet in the first place, of course. Do they have peaceful or aggressive intentions? How can we find out? Thus, the movie focuses on a central problem of any science fiction movie, namely the question how we, as human beings, would be able to communicate with living creatures from a different planet or even from a completely different galaxy. How, how would that be possible? So the protagonist of the movie, therefore, is a scientist of linguistics. Uh, it's not a physician, it's a, it's a scientist of linguistics. And I think this is really significant. Um, it is a woman, uh, Dr. Louise Banks, played by Amy Adams. The counterpart at her side <clears throat> is a male colleague from physics, performed by Jeremy Renner. From time to time, they enter the spaceship that looks like a huge shell. You see it here on the, on the, on the still, um, a, a, a monolith uh, of the size of several hundreds of meters standing not on the ground, but in the air. So obviously the alien creatures have developed a kind of intelligence that is able to manipulate gravity. The two scientists start to communicate with two of the aliens, which they call heptapods, because of their seven extremities. In old Greek, hepta means seven and pod means foot, seven feet. It is clear right from the start that it won't work out to communicate on the level of talking. The noise uttered by the extraterrestrial being sounds like slow motion music in deep pitches produced by a synthesizer or a computer. It sounds like a chant of whales, which by the way reminds us that we have real aliens around us, friendly aliens around us, whose language we do not understand, right? So we should learn the language of the whales. Instead of talking, then Louise tries out writing. As a well-educated human being, she first introduces herself and her partners by writing down the word human, adding later her name. And indeed, the aliens answer by writing or painting signs on the glass wall that separates them from the scientists, signs that look like artistic circles of an ink drawing. From now on, the scientists succeed in learning to understand step by step the foreign language. But of course, constitutive problems of understanding, interpretation and translation persist. So, we, in, in, philosophically speaking, we, we enter the, the, the area of a hermeneutic, of a hermeneutic premise, of hermeneutic philosophy. Why? Well, the situation of the scientists in arrival is similar to the one described by Quine and Davidson, where a team of ethnological 
field researchers is confronted with a completely foreign language, right, in Quine and Davidson. The situation is similar also to Gadamer's analysis of the relationship between a text and an interpreter in his book on hermeneutics. According to them, understanding presupposes that there are at least some common basic convictions. Otherwise, there would be nothing but confusion. And secondly, understanding has to start with some hypotheses and then try to come to a better understanding confirmed by a network of mutual interweavements. Now, this is the classical Gadamer davidson <coughs> uh, Quine thesis. This entangling that interweavement is something that can be done only to some extent. That means there will always be uh, a case that remains unclear or fuzzy, we may say. Arrival, the movie reaches that point where something remains fuzzy, unclear, when after some time, Louise translates one of the drawn logograms as offer weapon. So this is interpreted by Louise as offer weapon. A militant escalation then seems to be unavoidable. Louise decides to get in contact once again with the extraterrestrial creatures. And this time it is, we are in a movie, a direct contact. She communicates with one of the creatures without the glass wall between them. This is very surprising because of the physiological conditions. New, our human beings need oxygen, the extraterrestrial creatures don't. And consequently, the, the contact transfers Louise in a kind of steam bath in slow motion as if it were a dream. Finding herself in such a strange and confusing condition, it finally becomes clear where those images and scenes come from that are flashing up and haunting her from time to time. Images and scenes of a child, a girl, which obviously is her child. Since Louise never was married and didn't have a child, it becomes clear that these images weren't memories, but visions. Louise can see the future. And this is possible because of the offer the extraterrestrial creatures want to give to humanity. It is not, as it was first translated misleadingly, a weapon, but a gift, the gift of another language. And thus, so it seems, another kind of thinking. So we have a general hypothesis here, namely language constitutes thought. And there is a specific hypothesis, language constitutes experience of and thought about time. As long as our language is linear, our, our experience of time will be linear as well. If we change our concept of time in a circular way, on a higher level maybe, our experience of time will change as well. That's the hypothesis. So in linguistics, that uh, hypothesis is known and is also mentioned in the movie at least once. It's the so-called sapir Worf hypothesis. It stems from Benjamin Lee Worf and his teacher, Edward Sapir, and claims that the way people think is influenced or even determined by the semantic structure and the vocabulary of their native language. Today, the sapir whorf hypothesis is discussed from a differentiated experience. I'm not an expert, but I learned something by reading uh, texts from my colleagues from the linguistic department. Thus, though there is, I give you an example, no adequate translation of the German word Bildung. You can't transfer, transfer that word into other languages. In English, it is translated as education, 
cultivation formation. In Portuguese, I've, I've, I've learned as instrução, formação, educação. So, though it is difficult, if not impossible, to translate that term into other languages, people who grow up in England, the USA, in Portugal, or in Brazil, nevertheless are able to get a certain understanding of that word. Thus, it is important to distinguish between a strong and weaker version of the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. The strong version claiming that language completely determines thought is not convincing. Whereas the weaker claim telling us that language influences thought to a smaller or bigger extent is very convincing. Another example, if you ask native Germans and native Spaniards about their associations as to the word bridge, in German Brücke, in Spanish Puente, Germans tend to come up with typical feminine attributes like elegant, pretty, etc. Whereas Spaniards tend to come up with typical male attributes like big, strong, etc. The reason for this seems to lie in the simple fact that the German word grammatically is feminine, die Brücke, whereas the Spanish word grammatically is masculine, el puente. In philosophy, yeah, in philosophy, the hypothesis about the, the, the formative power of language is prepared by thinkers of the late 18th and early 19th century. I, I, I mentioned them below. So you see Herder, you see Schleiermacher, you see Wilhelm von Humboldt. They all belong to the intellectual movement of the so-called late enlightenment, the Weimar classicism around Goethe, German idealism and romanticism. So on the one hand, they recognize the as they say, the individual totality of any language. Any language is an individual totality. That means every language develops a holistic and individual connection of meaning. So this is the one side. On the other hand, they still count on universal structures in the composition of language and don't draw a relativistic consequence claiming as Heidegger did much later, claiming that there is a plurality of linguistic world pictures, Weltbilder in German. So you can draw a relativistic consequence of, of, of that hypothesis, but they, so Schleiermacher, Humboldt, Herder, they didn't, they tried to find a balance. So if we compare arrival with the differentiations of the language thought hypothesis given in linguistics and philosophy, the movie obviously goes for the strong hypothesis. So determination, not only influence, it's determination. And it, this hypothesis is, of course, famously expressed by the late Friedrich Nietzsche. I quote, I'm afraid we don't get rid of God because we still have faith in grammar. And it is the grammar that forces us to link a subject with a predicate. S is P. The chair is small. Coffee tastes fine. Democracy is good. And therefore generates the thought that S and P are two separated things and that especially S is a kind of substance to which we can add properties. God, the substance of all substances, if you express it philosophically, God in that sense is a final result of grammar. Similarly, arrival shows us that the more Louise gets in contact with the alien creatures, the more she learns to speak their language, and this means the more she becomes part of another way of thinking. 
in the end, she is able to have visions of the future because she has completely dived into a circular way of thinking where the future, so to speak, returns. And here, finally, a third interesting philosophical hypothesis appears. So I'd, I've talked about the hermeneutic hypothesis. I've talked about the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And now comes a third very interesting hypothesis in that movie, namely an ethical one. And it connects us to our, to our guiding topic, traveling again. So Louise doesn't undergo a time travel in the physicalist sense as the astronaut Cooper does in Interstellar. Rather, she undergoes a learning process. We might say a journey with obstacles toward another concept of time. Once she has reached that point, an ethical question comes up. She asks that question to her, to her male colleague, the physicist, yeah, I'm, here we are, the third hypothesis, an ontological one. <clears throat> so this is the question she asks. If you could see your whole life from start to finish, would you change things? The question, of course, reminds us as philosophers to those famous and infamous passages, again, in Nietzsche, where he presents his speculations about as he calls it, the greatest weight or the heavy weight of human existence, namely the idea of eternal recurrence. If you had to live your life once again, or even countless times, with every pain and every pleasure, all the small and big events, would you accept and acknowledge, even welcome it, or would you refuse it? Or, a third possibility, would you accept or refuse it only in parts? Change some things that you don't like any longer? Change those things to make your life more perfect? Nietzsche does not offer the last option, let us say the bricolage option. And the reason for this is that he is deeply convinced from an underlying holistic premise, namely that a person is nothing but the totality of its experiences and actions. And in the background of that personality hypothesis, there is a more general ontological hypothesis, namely that, I quote Nietzsche, all things are enlinked, all things are enlaced, connected to each other. The Nietzsche of the late writings, this is the Nietzsche I'm talking about, so the Nietzsche above all of Zarathustra presents himself as a, so, so we would express it today, as an ontological relationist. Everything that is, is what it is, only in relation to other things. Restricted to the personality hypothesis, it follows that if any of the experiences and actions of a subject were different, then the subject would also have to be different. In his holistic view, all, propos all properties are equally essential. If you change one of these properties, you would simply become another subject. So one could reformulate Louise's question also in the sense of eternal recurrence. Would you want to change things in your life that impose deep pain on you? Louise's answer is no. She knows that she will have give birth to a child, to a daughter that will die from a disease in the age of 10 or so. So though she knows that, she says, I accept it. Do you want to live your life though you know that it will cause not only pleasure and happiness, but also pain and suffering? Louise's answer is yes. I quote, and you find it also on, uh, on the uh, uh, sl uh, slate here. Um, so quote Louise, a quote from the movie. 
despite knowing the journey and where it leads. So it's a journey. For her, it's a journey. Despite knowing the journey and where it leads, I embrace it. And I welcome every moment of it. This is what Nietzsche Zarathustra would welcome as well. But in a wider trans-European and general context, we can find such an attitude in other cultures as well, prominently in Asian ethical religious wisdom. The journey itself must be the, the reward. So this is the, the famous and meanwhile popular Asian ethical religious wisdom. The journey itself is the reward. Though it is common practice to travel from A to B, the process of traveling is much more important than reaching B. And being focused on the process means being focused on the particular moment we are in. Let me draw my conclusion. Or may I draw a conclusion at all now after, after I have, I have said this about the process and the relevance of the process? May I ask what we get at the end of my talk? Wouldn't it be more important to follow the process of my argumentation and the line of the story? Were the real insights not to be found in the particular moments of my presentation? To be sure, I can sum up my talk by stating that interstellar being based on the theory of quantum physics, aesthetically facilitates an experience of time as space. Whereas arrival, being based on linguistic and philosophical hypotheses, makes plausible that entering a certain space, a space of interaction with living creatures, changes our way of thinking and thus our experience and idea of time. If it is a non-linear way of thinking we practically get familiar with, we will get familiar also with a concept and experience of time, which is non-linear, specifically higher level circular. The ethical result of this is an attitude of ontological affirmation. But summing up my talk in that way only gives us an abstract, a very short presentation, abstracted from the particular steps of my presentation. And it is these steps, these moments, that are convincing and illuminating, or not. In that sense, we can say once again that the journey itself must be the reward. I hope it has been a reward. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Josef, for this wonderful and really inspiring lecture. Uh, let's wait with uh, a little uh, questions that are coming from the, from the audience, but. Uh, I should say that words like that uh, make me feel that we should give human beings a second chance in this beautiful planet that we are destroying. Uh, yeah. the, the question uh, raised in my mind uh, during, during the you know, lecture was about love, actually. And uh, I put this uh, so shortly, like, uh, would be love somehow important to time traveling? Let me explain it. In both films you have so brilliant uh, analyzed, love was uh, completely important to communication. So interstellar, the father and daughter, communicate to each other beyond space-time borders or beyond space-time limits using the, the watch, né? the Morse code, the Morse uh, alphabet. Yeah. Of course, but there is a profound love that surrounds them. 
Uh, the arrival uh, show us that aliens came to Earth to give us something. At the end, we see that as a gift that could change ourselves and our world. I see generosity in this movement, and I see love in this movement too. <clears throat> so would be love somehow important to time space traveling? What do you think? Yeah. Um, thank you, Miguel. I I guess I I completely understand that question. In fact, I had a part in my paper, uh, a part abo above all <coughs> concerning interstellar uh, about love, uh, because of course uh, Hollywood doesn't doesn't give us a, a story, a movie without a love story. And so there is a love story in Interstellar between Cooper, the astronaut, and Amelia, the daughter of the NASA director. And indeed, it's, it's ambivalent in the movie. Yeah? On the one hand, you can see that the movie follows certain patterns, a something we, we all know as people who are familiar with Hollywood movies. So this is, you, you might say from a more critical uh, and Marxist perspective, you might say, you see the ideology of the, the, the idea of love in that movie. But on the other hand, I, I would say there is indeed something uh, essential in the concept of love for anybody who is talking about hermeneutics. So if you do what we as philosophers often do, that's one part of our, of our uh, self-understanding, namely thinking about what it means to understand, to understand a text. We, again and again, from Gadama via, I mean, Davidson Quine less, but certainly in Gadama and others, we come back to the idea that it has to do with a, a an emotions of giving yourself over to something else. And if you want to have a very simple psychological definition of love, you could say, well, this is what happens when we fall in love, right? The English expression here is, is quite helpful. We fall in love when you don't know where this ends. It can be an abyss. Yeah? You you can fall into really a, a kind of black hole, right? This happens, as we all know, and the expression tells us it's not up to me. To to my decision, where this leads, where this goes to, it's up to something else, to the partner, to the circumstances, and in so far, I indeed would say, yeah, for both movies. A broad uh, understanding of love, giving oneself over to something, is is very important. In that sense, certainly, I would agree. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's. Uh, I will read a question from. Uh, from Lucio, uh, he says, how, how do you see the representation of time in uh, movies, cutting and editing techniques, and how this language uh, and no, no, no linear cutting have been influencing common sense time perception? Right? How editing uh, is connected to uh, to our sense of, of, of time. Yeah. Is field language shaping our time perception also? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. I, I, I mean, let me, let me say once again that one of my central uh, claims in my, in my paper indeed was that film itself is 
manipulating time and space. So only film, I, I, I really would say, this is a, a specific feature of film. There is no other um, aesthetic form until now. Until now, we didn't develop another aesthetic form that is so wonderfully able to manipulate time and space. Uh, because the, in fact, every movie does that, but it was, let's say, the modern development of cinema after the Second World War. So if you look at it from a, from a European perspective, then you say, okay, uh, the French uh, cinema after the Second World War, the Italian uh, cinema, and, and later the German uh, cinema in the 1970s. This is the, 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 the entrance into a kind of cinematic self-reflection where the directors more and more became aware of their manipulative power. But with the difference to former Hollywood movies that they show to us their manipulation. Uh, if you watch a movie of, presented by Godard or Antonioni um, or Wim Wenders, Fassbender, I, yeah, I just refer to some of those heroes of the post-Second World War cinema, you always will see that the movie shows what it does. It does not want to hide his strategy. So in that sense, it is not manipulative. It does not want to uh, send you a message not telling you that there is a message. No, all the time, uh, these kinds of mo movies keep us aware that we are following a movie. And this is, this is the, the, the modern uh, uh, development where you do both steps. On the one hand, you manipulate time and space, something yeah, astrophysics call the space-time continuum. This, is, this happens in a very, um, you may say, ordinary way in every cinema. Uh, I I really like that idea. I don't have to go, I don't have to go out of space like an astronaut to make to have that experience. Uh, I'm exaggerating now, of course. It's it's just enough to to go around the corner to watch into a movie theater and see a movie. The movie will give me the experience of space time continuum. Um, and if it's a modern one, it tells me even. Hey, Joseph, you are following a movie. You are, I, I, I show to you how a space-time continuum is constructed and deconstructed at the same time. Uh, this is something I really like in, in, modern, in modern cinema. And it, I, I repeat, it's only cinema, not theater, not music, not literature, not poetry. Only the movie is able to give us that experience of space-time continuum. Yeah. Nice. We hope soon we have the, the movie theater open to, to go on <laughs> with this. É, Miguel, posso fazer uma pergunta daqui? Peraí que tem umas perguntinhas aqui. É, isso é só para me inscrever, tá? Uh, tá. Uh, so Carla is asking to, to put a question to you, but I have a list of, so she will wait a little. So, uh, uh, one uh, question from uh, Kayla. Uh, she is about learning. And uh, uh, she said, uh, one kind of, uh, uh, one kind of uh, thinking, so in a way, non-linear uh, experiencing moments, uh, Phenomena uh, could uh, open another possibilities of uh, space and time, uh, helping us to appreciate better the journeys, uh, the journeys and the, the, the process. Né, as you said, mm. then the question: né, uh, Could we, uh, following this, uh, put learning 
uh, as uh, much more accepting uh, sufferings, loss, and also joys in, in this uh, profundity. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure whether I, 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 I get the point. Yeah, maybe it was my, my translation was so, so bad here. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let, let's see. Uh, On the one hand, I already answered the question a little bit by saying um, there is one thing only a movie can, can give us. Uh, the, the, the experience of spatializing time or temporalizing space. This is something only a movie can give us. So in that sense, it's, we can learn a, a non-linear way of thinking really learn, I, 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 I accept that word from you. We can learn that by watching a movie. But second point, on the other hand, of course, there are other ways of, of getting familiar with non-linear ways of, of thinking and experiencing. So um, every, uh, every poem I read is a simple example for uh, though I start f from one end uh, uh, and from one side of the poem and go step by step, word by word to another one, I realize while I'm reading, already in the process of reading, I realize I have to, I have to return. Again and again, I have to return to the beginning. I have to return to another word. So in the end, when I look upon a poem, I see myself looking on a spiral. It's really a spiral of meanings. And this is something I really would suggest as a, as a metaphor for learning. If you want a good metaphor what learning means, I would say it moves like a spiral. It goes up, it, you, really, you really get better. So you learn, you learn to understand something better upwards. But on the other hand, it's not, it's not like, a, like a direct line in the future. No, in a certain way, you come back to your beginning and you go up and the same time you go back to the beginning. Uh, yeah, philosophers immediately would say, okay, that's, that's Hegel. The German philosopher Hegel suggested this as a model for learning. This is, this is learning, a spiral. And I, I, I love that metaphor. And I, I think that metaphor it, it can be used not only, in, not only for films. It can be used for diverse uh, areas, poetry and other things. Uh, I'm not sure whether... Uh, yeah, it was nice uh, to, to... So I have... I have a better translation, so that. But I think you 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 put some 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 good uh, response here. So the question was: Learning could be more about accept sufferings and loss, but also could be about joys in their deep meanings. I, I think you responded it, but you can uh, talk yeah. a little more. And then two questions that was they they were about the same subject. The one from Giselle and uh, the other one from Mariana, but from this, from the same subject, is about uh, 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 the woman you said uh, that uh, the she was uh, the the scientist, the linguistics, uh, and, and she had a special role uh, in the in the film. But you could not uh, uh, develop this. Why? Uh, why is this so important that uh, the linguistic, the scientist, is a woman? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, thanks for that question. Indeed, I I, di I didn't explain that, but again, I would say a little bit similar to my answer uh, as to interstellar. The, um, it's it's ambivalent. So on the one hand, you see that. Uh, Villeneuve, the, the, direc the director of the movie, follows a, a pattern. You might even say a cliché. Of course, in the case of Arrival, he chooses a woman 
as the main figure because he needs uh, a human existence, a human existence that is able um, to, in a certain way, to transform herself. And as we all know, in our uh, European and well, if we may say that Western understanding of uh, of gender patterns. Uh, classically, uh, the woman is depicted, constructed as the one who is much more able to do that than uh, the, 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 the male figure uh, being interested in keeping himself strong. Uh, and that means not to give over. Yeah. So in so far, the movie follows a, a typical uh, and a classical uh, structure of our uh, self-understanding, again, you might say from a Marxist perspective, an ideology. On the other hand, I, I think it's interesting how uh, the movie uh, Arrival um, works with that, with that um, cliche, with that ideology, because um, the, the main actor uh, is very self-reflective and knows um, that what happens is much more than a typical uh, cliche uh, thing of our culture. So in, in that sense, I would say the movie is, is wiser than the ideology uh, it, it presents. Huh? And ambivalent. In, in both cases, I would say it's ambivalent. There is a kind of classical ideological uh, perspective. On the other hand, the movie itself is able to transform that cliche in presenting a very self-reflective uh, figure. That that's my 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 general answer to. Yeah. Nice, thank you. Uh, so, Carla, want to want to, to to make a question, please, Carla. Then Hi, we finish. <laughs> Hello, how are you? Hello. Glad to meet you here. Oh, to see you here. Uh, uh, remotely. So, I had a question, and I don't know the film you, you spoke about, and but. It has to do with what you said at the beginning and, uh, and also with these linguistics, uh, aspect, aspect, aspect. So, uh, traveling, you said, is not directly a philosophical theme or not a theme in philosophy. And, um, um, it, the, the, the closer you, you said would be experience, especially in German, Erfahrung. Né? Um, let's think about ice thesis as Wahrnehmung in German and not perception. We, we are closer to the English word. So um, when we think of aesthetics of travel, and uh, we, at first we thought about the perception of traveling. So in this sense, uh, so aesthetics as perception and perception as a kind of experience. <laughs> and uh, so only to, to, to think about one of the themes that um, were in the conference, uh, if there is also a kind of true meaning uh, in perception, if you think about the German word, mm -hmm. uh, what do you say about this model, this narrative model that was so important for philosophy as well, of Goethe, Goethe's journey to Italy. So, mm. what would be this um, when he says that was a kind of rebirth in Rome? Uh, would you say uh, a kind of experience that um, this traveling, this journey to Italy brought to him and to I would say a German tradition of traveling. So how close do they get to the true meaning of traveling? Uh, 
Mm. Um, sorry, not directed to your talk, but at the beginning of your talk. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you, Carla. Uh, nice to see you, at least from from here. Miguel, do we have time? Uh, I mean, I, I I see it's already it's already four o'clock. We yes. close immediately after your uh, your yeah. talk. You can respond, yeah. do the the, the yeah. comment, and then we we close. Yeah. Um, Carla, let me let me ask very very briefly. It's I, I think again that it's um, how should we say it's it's striking. It's typical that you refer to someone like Goethe, who is a writer. You don't refer to a philosopher <clears throat> as as an example for how important traveling is for having experiences, for learning, for changing, etc. Um, again, I would say very briefly, um, the, the parallel to Goethe is Hegel. The, if, if we want to have a philosopher of traveling, a philosopher of experience, a philosopher that tells us what having an experience means. Uh, Kant gave an answer, Locke gave an answer, but I, I would say Hegel's answer is much, much more uh, integrative. Um, I, I would say Hegel's answer is a philosophical formulation of Goethe's experience. If, to have an experience is to change one's perspective, to go on in a way, to better understand, to learn, to, yeah, as we said right in the beginning. Um, so a very brief and answer and something we should have, we should talk much more about that. But if you give me Goethe, I would say the philosophical parallel, once again, is Hegel. This, this is it. Thank you very much, Joseph. It was a wonderful uh, uh, comment, I think, because, uh, yeah, so we should go back to Hegel and learn more about traveling. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. you very much. Uh, we are with this another uh, lecture from uh, Willy Bolly. I just I'm, advise our, our, our audience that we have a second link to that. So wow. I give you uh, for uh, some some words, Joseph. If you want, then we close the the, the, the live session. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miguel. I don't want to talk longer now. I I appreciate it to to have to have been invited and. Uh, being able to present my my observations uh, and uh, once again my thanks to you Miguel Carla and the whole group um, uh, I I hope uh, yeah you finished today I I learned so um, you've you've had a lot of work but I hope it was also exciting it was also it was nice and next time hopefully we see us all together. Uh, somewhere in Brazil, okay? Okay. Okay, Guilherme. Bye-bye.